Hi, my name is Lama Al-Humaisi, and I'm in Dave's studio at Westbeth. Um, so I am Dave's next door neighbor, and one day after I moved in, I got a note slipped under the door, and it was from Dave. And he was like, hey, I've been friends with the residents in this specific unit before. No pressure. You can say, leave me alone and I want my space, or do you want to meet up? And um, so he left his number and I responded by text. Um, and here we are. <laughs> I mean, it's been a long two years now that I've been at Westbeth, so certainly we didn't end up here right away. We've had a blossoming friendship. Uh, since I moved in and uh, I always tell the people um, who are in charge of the artist like art program that I'm in uh, at Westbeth that Dave like should be mentioned in in the application of the process or because for every single resident he's had um, he's played such a vital role in uh, in their time here um, almost like a mentor you know and uh, yeah just honorary mention, Dave Blackie. <laughs> so the reason that I'm here is basically I applied for an artistic residency at West Beth Artist Housing, and it's part of a, a coalition and a program called Safe Haven Incubator for Music. Um, it's supported by Artistic Freedom Initiative, Tamazdat, Joe's Pub, and they picked me. Um, to be the artist in residence and I've been working on two projects while I've been here a solo cabaret called Not Hair and Material which I presented at Joe's Pub um, October 2023 and the other project is a longer project and it's a musical a rock musical um, set in Beirut and it's called Radio Beirut um, I spent my whole life in Beirut. I was born in 1991, and uh, it was the first year after um, a long civil war had just ended. And so we're known as like the post-war generation. However, that does confuse people because more wars came after. So what war? The civil war, um, 1991. And um, I'm born to artists. Uh, my father is a theater artist. His main area of specialty is pantomime but he definitely has been a writer producer actor and many other mediums uh, and my mother is a visual artist she she's a painter but obviously that also extends to mask making puppets um, all of that stuff and uh, i feel like my you know i feel like we we're like a little bit of a circus family like my dad's shows that he would put on were always a, a family affair like we were all involved um, my mom would make the posters um, any props or masks or puppets that were a part of the shows that he did she would collaborate on or make um, i basically when I was old enough and, and into theater enough myself, I, I started painting his face before his shows, which was really intimate and a little bit scary. Um, and my brother would help with ushering and just, just, you know, just anything that we could do behind the scenes. Um, and I feel like that's a really special upbringing and not what always people imagine and visualize when they think of Beirut, which really pisses me off. Because um, I feel like, you know, I love talking about my upbringing and I love talking about just where I'm from and what I do. But I hate it when I feel like I'm essentially always getting like surprised answers. Like, like it almost puts me in a position where everything I've shared was for the purpose of humanizing myself, which I feel like should be a given. And also a lot of the reactions I get are almost like, oh my God, it's like you're so civilized and I never thought that that would be possible. Or wow, your English is so good. And you know, it's, it's a lot of these come with like, a lot of comments like these, uh, they're a little bit veiled, you know, there's something behind that. And I felt those shifts in, in conversations. Like I felt a shift from, having a very normal conversation in America to 
essentially someone like switching entirely their entire tone and how they feel about me and what they're asking me the moment they find out where I'm from. So I'd always been a part of artistic circles, um, whether I was a teen or in college, you know, I went and I studied filmmaking. I then went on to work in television, more so reality TV. I really would have loved to do more fiction writing, but um, a lot of the production and money was in reality, like talent competitions. Um, and I had like four great years of working on those um, and writing original shows, as well as adapting foreign shows to the region, uh, such as The Voice and So You Think You Can Dance and, you know, all these things. Um, but I really wanted to write stories. I wanted to write fiction and I had a passion for performance as well. Um, I feel like my dad always deterred me from being in the performance um, position because you'd always be at the mercy of whoever was going to cast you. Um, and I did a lot of behind the scenes work and I still really love to work in it. But I, I remember going up to him at some point being like, Dad, I can't do it. I really tried, but I've got to, I've got to perform. And he was like, Valid, valid, you know, you, you, you tried. And he was like, I just want you to understand, you know, that, that you get a lot more agency when you tell your own stories. And um, I feel like I found a happy middle because after that, I, I applied to a master's program in the US um, in Boston. So I did um, an MFA in musical theater. And it was a little bit, you know, um, of like a very condensed program helping people who haven't been training their whole lives, you know, because I didn't really have access to more like the Broadway or American style of musical theater, you know, training back home. Um, just more isolated acting training or music training, but never really, you know, a, a program that brought it all together. And I also wanted the opportunity to, to come here and see how I would do. Um, New York has always been a place that I thought about, you know, ever since I was eight, I think. I think that was like, I remember really vividly writing about it in my diary and being like, I'm going to practice my English. So it's so perfect. No one can give, like, have an excuse not to cast me. Um, and I just wanted to, to blend in and, and be really evaluated on my talents. And um, so I came to the program and it was in Boston, Massachusetts. And the program was about two to three years. Um, and what was really great about it is there wasn't just the focus on training you as a performer, you know, singer, dancer, actor, but our thesis was an original show. So I really got to keep writing, but I transferred it to theater and uh, performed in that piece. And it was called Article 534, which um, is the law that uh, criminalizes LGBTQIA plus communities in Lebanon. Or basically it just says that it's like, those activities are contrary to the order of nature and people are penalized like under the same law that people who commit bestiality are penalized under. So that's what that piece was about. Um, and I definitely feel like I've, I was able to marry like these different things and aspects, like, you know, from being in my involved with my dad's mime shows to um, being like really into into film and and working on my own original films, documentaries, the TV work, and then eventually like stepping into it as a performer, and continuing to do all those things, um, including making music. Um, so I have really I have a hard time defining what I do. You know, like Lama Al Hamaisi is an actor, singer, writer, an actor, educator. You know, whatever, whatever it is, like I, I struggle. So I just go with like multi hyphenates um, <laughs> and I never want to stop doing any of the things I want to. You know, I, I'm, I'm a visual artist, too, but I, I don't really monetize it. Um, that's another thing. I feel like I have to preserve an art form that I don't monetize because I'm going to end up hating it or getting so anxious that I <laughs> I lose the love I had for it because it's attached now to all these different pressures and other things. Um, so I'd say as much as I talk about my artistic path and the things that led me here, I'd say I also had a personal journey um, with the little critic in here. <laughs> She's a bitch. <laughs> um, and 
I really love like the people I've met uh, in the U.S. Like, there's almost like an uh, unapologetic support. Um, there's an encouragement to fail gloriously because art is trying and workshopping and process and that's been I think one of my biggest lessons. I feel like a lot of the unlearning I've done is preconceived notions about what I like needing a, a perfect end product um, and I feel like I've gotten to points where I've been such a perfectionist that I will almost say nothing um, because I'm not really quite done. And I met one of my idols one day. This is actually a cool story. I haven't told you, Dave, about it. But Amanda Palmer from the Dresden Dolls. I mean, you could imagine. I'm 12 years old. I'm going online. I'm, I'm looking for new music. And I find this like punk cabaret band it's a duo there's a drummer and she plays piano and the, the lead singer plays piano and she sings and they're in, in, in my makeup and I'm like what is happening this is like <laughs> all my worlds combined and I, I they really were a big part of like forming like influence and forming my identity like as a teenager you know it was like a very they played a vital role in in in, in, in all the things I've gone through all these years, even into my well into my 20s. So Amanda Palmer was coming to Berklee College of Music, which is the, where, the pro, like, where I studied my MFA in musical theater. It was at Boston Conservatory at Berklee. She was coming to speak about mental health. And uh, someone came into my office where I worked. I had two jobs on campus. I, was, I, worked in the, I had two jobs on campus. I worked in, a, in the career center. And I worked in the audiovisual uh, team, filming like the concerts and recitals at night. Um, so I was always in class or working. And her assistant comes in and knocks on like the career center door, and is like, "Does anyone have a pen or something like a, a, a sharpie? Um, our guest needs it." And I knew who the guest was that day, so I grabbed the sharpie and I have to think quick. I had a thesis coming up. I, I was going through all of these, uh, like a lot of just stressors and feeling like almost like I, I, I was frozen, like I, I, I couldn't say what I needed to say because when you're writing a project about an actual like human, humanitarian thing, you feel like you have to say everything or you haven't really done it justice. So I had all these like questions floating. I grab this Sharpie, I grab a post-it and I write, <laughs> MFA student has questions for Amanda. <laughs> Um, uh, let me know if it, okay and I like put it on the sharpie and I give it to this lady and she's like thank you so much and she like runs away she comes back five minutes later she's like did you put this on the sharpie and I was like yeah <laughs> and she goes okay Amanda wants to talk to you she has five minutes and I did I can't believe this worked and, and I've just always been about like and this is also how I made it to the US and to the master's program and to Westbeth. I'm a believer in like sometimes the path or a solution is not in front of you. You literally have to invent it. You have to draw a door and then like become you knock and, and it becomes a real a real path. And so sometimes you have to create a solution or opportunity. Like if I've learned anything in, in life or if, if if I have to credit anything to my upbringing and, and uh, tougher times. I would say like a strong stomach during like survival is like, I don't know if I phrased that very well, but survival or like when you don't have a solution, just ha having no choice but to come up with one. You know, I feel like not a lot of people um, are born with tenacity like that. I certainly don't think I was born with it. I think it, it was just something I like learned as an ethic of like work. And I got to sit down with her and I remember she was eating hummus, which was also a trip. I was like, <laughs> I wonder if I should tell you where I'm from. Um, and she was a little skeptical at the beginning. She didn't know if I was just like a fan who was going to waste her five minute you know, time to like eat before she goes on to do this talk and then go back on tour. And But I really went in and I had very constructive questions. And I asked her all the things about needing to say everything and feeling like I wouldn't be doing the community justice. And she was, she paused and she was nodding and she was listening and she was like, you hear all that? 
<laughs> all of that energy and all of that time that you just took up worrying about the quality of the message that you're saying, the very real and urgent message that you're saying, you're worried so much about the packaging of it, that in the meantime, you've got five bigots shouting from the top of a building their stupid, stupid, stupid ideas, their stupid racist uh, BS. And meanwhile, you're still being hypercritical of what you're saying and how you're saying it and all that. And she was like, I need you to throw polish out the door. Um, she was like, I need you to just say what you need to say. And then whatever presentation of it is just what it is on that day in the process it's it's a proof of concept it's and she's like i she told me she was like i never release songs that are finished i will release a raw version two weeks later a friend of mine plays cello and they will play on it and it's a personal collaboration we'll release that recording nothing has been in a studio polished or or produced or too much and then eventually she'll record it like she is she really gave me a gift that day, I think. And um, in the words of Adore Delano, a uh, drag queen I really, really love, I'm polish remover, bitch. <laughs> I try to live by those words. <laughs>